people. I can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference. But it makes a lot of difference how the Muslims we have behave. The akhlaq of the Muslim is really what it's all about. The behavior, the manners, the way of the Muslim. When we talk about the people of the West, so-called West, and the so-called East, so-called Middle East, there will always be cultural difference, and there's going to be traditions that some tribes and people have that will separate them from the other people. But when we start talking about religion, most religions have something that are that kind of leans toward their own area. For instance, Hindus obviously are going to be basically from India. Why? Well, that's really the name. It's not really India. It's Hindustan, and their religion's named after the place. That's Hinduism. Christianity is not exactly the same way, though, because it does have adherence from all of the population of the world. Judaism, on the other hand, is pretty strict. If you want to be a real Jew, you have to be born under the tribe of Judah. So the only way you can really join is get a blood transfusion from somebody that's <laughs> from there. If you want to go by that. And then Buddhism is just limited really to uh, certain areas. Some people are attracted to it, but what about Islam? Islam claims to be for all places and all people and all times. This is the claim in Islam. Because I grew up with a Christian background, I can speak from that to the extent, at least for the first 50 years, and tell you that I definitely saw, whether they will ever admit it or not, prejudice. Because even today, we have Christian churches that are for Chinese and Christian churches for Japanese. And we have Christian churches for black people, Christian churches for Mexican people, even though they speak English. But wouldn't it be strange to you and I if somebody said, oh, don't go to that mosque over there because that's black people? Because any masjid in the world could have a black person as the imam, or a white person, or a yellow person, or any color person, and we wouldn't think about it, would we? <laughs> All we want to know is can he recite the Quran correctly? That would be the main thing. When Malcolm X was... Re close to real Islam. You know, it used to be in the nation of Islam. But when he came to real Islam, that was one of the things that struck him because he had gone for Hajj. And he was amazed. He said, you'd be praying right next to a white person. And uh, blacks and browns and all the colors, and all you know, all together. He was amazed. He talked about it. One of the things he said was that when he did Salah in some small masjid. In, in Mecca, they weren't actually at the big haram. They were in a small masjid. He said that he noticed that the one leading was probably from Africa, but he was black. And so he went to him after the prayer and he said, did you ever think you'd have a chance to be leading prayer in front of all these white guys? <laughs> he said, the man looked at him and said, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Because of the stigma, the thing that he grew up in, in his mentality, this was a big deal, you know? To try to finally get a chance to be up at level with Whitey. That's what he talked about. And I watched... The, I, by the way, I used to be white. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I tried to keep a straight face. I couldn't. <laughs> but I used to watch. When I was real little, I watched my cousins, you know. And they were telling me something one time about coloreds. And I, and I was thinking color, you know, color. At that time was a big deal because movies were black and white. What television there was, and there weren't that many TVs around, they were all black and white, but there was something new out called Technicolor. This is a big deal. Tadeo, Technicolor, and there was something called Buena Vista, which is a part of Disney for the animal things, kind of like the, the early version of Animal Planet, okay, that they had in the movie house, and it was in color, Technicolor. So when you start talking about with his friends about, we're going to see some coloreds today, colored people. And I was thinking, wow, like rainbows or something, I'm imagining. I have no idea what they were talking about until we were going down the, to the beach and they had a big sign up, no coloreds. And I'm thinking, why can't you have any color on the beach? I don't get it. This is 1940s and it was so bad that people took it for granted and it was all right. But still, little kids, they don't get this. They don't really see that because they start out innocent. We mentioned that last night, that when children are born, they're in a state of innocence, not a state of guilt, you know. And so they don't perceive this, this horrible thing. In Arabic, you've got something that extends over into tribalism and, and bipartisanism. It's called asabiya. And this is... Worse than that. It's something horrible. And so we were now making a migration from up north to Texas. I remember that. And on the way, we stopped in a place called Arkansas. When we stopped in the gas station, my dad told the kids, said, go back there, you guys use the bathroom, come on, and we're going to go. You know how it would be. Well, my, my sisters got the ladies, but girls, you know, and somebody else had the men's, and I kept going, and that said, colored. I said, yeah, colored. That's going to be great, you know. I wanted to see what a colored bathroom looked like inside. <laughs> I could imagine that was going to be something. And when I come out of it, I said, ah, not that great of a bathroom, you know. <laughs> and some guy saw me come and said, what did you go in there for? I didn't want to tell him, you know. <laughs> I used the bathroom. He said, no, that's for colored. I didn't get it. But even though we've been through a lot in our country and we've seen busing, taking the black children to the white areas, white children to the black areas, they spent all of our Social Security money to do it. All the reserve for Social Security, they used it up for that. In the 60s, it got really bad, and then it got to the point where we had some very serious violence. And when Martin Luther King, Jr., was given a speech, he said that he had a dream, and his dream was to see the children all together, growing up together, going to school together. That was a dream that he had, and he said that. Right after that, they assassinated him. They killed him. This is the kind of hatred that comes with that. For what? For the color of his skin? Can you imagine that? And you might think that that's all over with. We don't have that problem. No. What it does, it just goes deeper. It hides its head down low, you know, under the radar. But it's still there. If you doubt what I said, and it extends beyond just the white-black thing, it's also a man-woman thing. You know, in the West, they still have a problem with women holding high position. You believe that? How come Hillary Clinton is out of the race? Hmm? Because... And we watch what happens now with Obama when he goes up against McCain. McLean is what? What color? 
real white. <laughs> we'll see. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. We'll see. The point that I'm trying to get at really is how much the West really needs to understand what the true Islam is about because it's the thing that they claim to be looking for, the, the claim that they're making when they make their big speeches and pontificate ad infinitum on their great and wonderful principles that they'd like to offer to the people of the ignorant, you know, backward third world countries. A white girl who is a Christian in Colorado was talking with friends and got the notion that she needed to go save the Muslims and others of Africa. She joined some peace group, whatever it was, and went traipsing all the way over to Africa. And she's out here, you know, going from place to place, thinking she's going to save these people. And she had a good, she had a good heart, don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun of her, just that this is the notion that she had. True, they were poor, so poor the people lived in grass huts. They were literally making their houses, and what they lived in, from whatever was available around them, palm trees and grass huts, things like this. But when she visited the village, the people would treat it like it was a festival. And she thought because, oh, I'm American, I'm going to give them civilization here. I'm going to, you know, save them and everything. And this is why they're holding this big celebration when I come. And they, there was food, a lot of food, more than she could eat. And the people would say, no, no, take more, take more, have more food, have more food. Oh, so she goes to the next village again. All the food is everywhere. They just eat, eat. Come on, go out, eat. Oh, we've got cucumbers, tomatoes, whatever, eat. Along the way, she was at one of the villages and the people were there. And she said, I cannot eat anymore. And she said, I, I thought you guys were like poor over here. She said, we are. Our children are starving. She said, well, was all this food everywhere I go? There's plenty of food. The guide that she had said, ma'am, it's because you're here. They're Muslims and they're taking everything they have for the whole village because you're the guest. Because this is Islam. It doesn't matter our condition. Our guests are first. She started crying. She said, I didn't come over here to hurt these people. I thought I could help them. And after she did a little soul searching, she realized that they actually had more than she did. Because she did not have the capacity to do what they were doing. To actually take food out of their own children's mouths. They were going from house to house. Do you have anything at all? I have a cucumber. Okay, have you got anything? I have half a tomato. Give it to us. What do you have over here? Okay. Oh, hey, a piece of bread. And they literally were taking everything they had. Just so she would not feel uncomfortable and insisting that she eat it. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But there are a lot of people in the world today who don't have a clue about that. They don't understand that. By the way, this lady made shahada, put on hijab, and went back to Colorado telling the people about Islam. Of course, they came up with this typical, for whoever goes to Islam, they've always got something to say about it. And in her case, Probably she got malaria or something. She's been crazy ever since. <laughs> when Cassius Clay, back, was it 50 years ago, 40 years ago? And he was a boxer. He was number one on top. And everybody's looking, Cassius Clay. Wow, who is this guy? Amazing. He accepted Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. You know what they said right away? Too many shots to the head. <laughs> That'll do it. Drive you nuts. Went right off. There was a jazz singer that Elton John was so jealous of. He was glad when he became a Muslim and he said, I never had any competition after he got out of the business. 
Who is he talking about? Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens. I think he was Greek Orthodox or something. I don't remember. But he was Christian, at least by name. But when he entered Islam, all the people that used to love it, oh, because he's, he's got a great voice. Even today, he's got a good voice. And very creative with his music. But as soon as he became Muslim, you know what they said? Because he had been in the hospital. Too many drugs. Look at that. And by the way, it was TV, not drugs he was in there for. But this is the kind of thing that people will say. And it means that they have to try to explain. Why do you have to explain? If somebody decided, for instance, they don't want to be a Republican, they want to be a Democrat, that's in my country, why do you have to explain something? Why can't it be? That's just a choice. Why does it have to make an excuse? And they do. You should hear some of the things that people said, even about me and my family, when we came to Islam. It was a lot harder, though. They had to work really hard to come up with something because, hey, everybody knew us. Everybody knew what we were all about. My dad started the Concerned Christian Centers. And he always had donated and worked to build things and gave, never took anything. So you couldn't even twist it around. Oh, well, they're trying to use this as a front for their business, like some Christians do. We didn't do that. Each time somebody goes to Islam, you will see there's going to be resistance. There's going to be heavy resistance. When I came to Islam, I got into Islam, and <laughs> some of my relatives were telling me, oh, stay away from those Muslims. And when I would explain, because that was the one that really called my family to Christianity to start with, okay? So when I go to Islam and I came back to them, now they were like, whoa, you know, we can't listen to you anymore. I said, well, I found the next step up. Come on, look. Something happened. A very bad experience happened with some Muslims. They did something really bad. Which, in fact, I never tell the story because it's that bad. Still, it was only a couple and it was... Certainly not representative of Islam. It was some bad people. That's all. And again, they come to me, right? See, see, we told you. We told you. Now come on back and be with us. I said, for what? I came in Islam, not for you, not for them. I came in Islam because it's the only thing that makes any sense. Islam is the only Thing that offers proof for everything it says. And there's nothing illogical about one staying one. One stays one. Hello? What's the problem? You don't have to go through this big contortion of, well, you see three and one and the Trinity is, and the way that, uh, uh, you, I, I just have faith. <laughs> you don't have to do that. And I like that. One equals one. End of story. No more explanation after that. And as far as Jesus being God, Son of God, part of God, what's the nature of Jesus? Simple, he was a human being, but he was a miracle creation of a human being, just like Adam and Eve. Next question. And so, when something like this happens and somebody comes into Islam, should it be that they've got a real easy road? should be real easy, yeah? Because if you go to the right way, why would it be difficult? It should be real simple. If you use that logic, then what happens is it should be then that all Muslims are in good shape all the time. It should be that, according to that logic, Muslims would never have any hard time. They would always be in a good way. Make sense? One of the places that I'm supposed to go speak coming up uh, in July, sent me something, I read it yesterday, and one of the speeches, they, they like to name the speeches, these are guys that do a speech, one, I mean a, a conference maybe once in their whole life, they put it together, they bring speakers in, they just give you a title or something, I remember one time they said, uh, coming to Islam, what can I do with that, and I said, that's the name of the speech, well, I said, what can I do with that? 
In, in this case, they wanted me to talk about the happy prophets. You know? Prophets, the happy people, something like this. And I looked at that and I went, what? I mean, this, what did you say? is like a cartoon? Yeah, it sounded like a cartoon show. Okay, the happy 